Today on Lightning Bugs. There's this myth, I feel, they woke up in the middle of the night and they had to express this very specific thing. Stephen King doesn't know how his book's going to end, but he knows the authors who know how they're going to end first. If I didn't learn to play piano before I died, then I'd be really disappointed because it seems like such fun. I would love to dedicate myself to everything because it all sounds so interesting. Everything. I probably spend more time emailing in a year than I do mm. choreographing in the same way that you probably spend more time traveling than you do performing. You're a professional traveler. I might go back to Beethoven and just kind of imagine that aside from being really bummed about his health and his hearing, that I don't imagine him doing his laundry. In fact, there's some evidence he may not have had to do that sort of thing. Hello, people. This is Ben Folds. It's Thursday. And today's guest is Caleb Teicher, an exceptionally talented dancer and choreographer based in New York City. Caleb also teaches tap, swing, and jazz dance all around the world. I got to know Caleb when they performed in my show at the Kennedy Center back in 2018 with the National Symphony Orchestra. Since then, they helped me record percussion and vocals for a Christmas special we did on TV in Boston. And they choreographed Regina Spector's residency on Broadway and much, much more. Let's get to it and bring Caleb in and talk with them about dance, art, and, and everything. One, two, Caleb Teicher, god damn. So where are you, Caleb? I'm in Grand Army Plaza area of Brooklyn, New York. These are not my dinosaurs in the backgrounds. These are someone else's dinosaurs. And uh, maybe, it's uh, not your maybe piano. someone else's. It's not my piano. I do have a piano, but it's not my piano. Check this out. Mm. That. That's pretty cool. How long have you been playing piano? I didn't even know you played piano. I didn't. I started two years ago. It just occurred to me maybe four or five years ago that if I didn't learn to play piano before I died, that I'd be really disappointed because it seems like such fun. Well, don't die now, but you've done it. Certainly, it's been great this year because I really can't tap dance in my apartment. I would get evicted probably immediately. I've been so adjacent to music, and I, I guess some of what I do, one might call music. I consider it dance. Now I'm kind of on this voracious tear through learning everything I never knew about harmonic theory and music theory and chord progressions and substitutions and qualities and, and all the, all the nerdy stuff. I don't remember learning piano. I mean, it, it, it's, it, and I, I suspect in, in a way that may be true of you and dance. I, I always sort of identified as a musician since I was listening to it when I was two years old, going from not knowing how to do it. Maybe I was delusional and I thought I could do it when I was two years old to being able to do it. I, I don't remember. But now when I learn something new, it illuminates for me how my mind works and how I might be learning it. I take a lot of cues from uh, someone who's kind of a guiding light in tap dance for me, her name is Brenda Buffalino. She's in her 80s now. And she is a remarkable tap dancer and choreographer and composer. And she doesn't really care about sticking to a medium. She is a potter. She she does preform pottery. I went to her house relatively recently and she has her paintings on the wall. And I kind of admire that sort of fearlessness. I think it's I think it's a balance. Of course, you you have to respect the the techniques and the traditions that come before you i'm sure there are some people who are completely self-taught pianists and who are amazing but it's a lot easier if someone tells you how other people have learned how to play piano well over the past several centuries and i if i can am trying to be fearless the chuck norris of of dance wouldn't that be great i would love to see chuck norris dance it's unfortunate i have a lot of friends who are really good at piano um <laughs> You know, I was going to say, is uh, Conrad helping you in this? No, not at all. I'm terrified to play in front of Conrad. And not because he would be uh, mean or, or anything, but just because I have so much respect for what he does and what you do and what Regina does. I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, you know, I play piano too. As I became a, 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 a like a piano player, almost I felt like by accident, I don't care if classical pianists look over my shoulder or what they think, because I, I, I know I'm a hack. That's kind of like a rock and roll mentality that I wish I had. 
you know, as playing, playing rock music, you can say, I don't give a fuck. Uh, if I'm doing this the way I'm supposed to, the whole point is not to do anything the way anyone's supposed to. Jazz originally was revolutionary, was avant-garde. Certainly jazz dance was. Jazz dance didn't look like any dancing that came from Eurocentric traditions or anything like that. Now there's so much tradition and so much reverence and so much legacy and lineage in jazz. So I think I, I often get caught up in that saying, I want to respect where this comes from. By respecting where this comes from, I'm respecting the the value, which is creativity. I don't become a uh, monkish about it. I don't I don't try to say I'm going to dedicate myself to this. I would love to dedicate myself to everything because it all sounds so interesting. Everything that that people people do seems interesting to me. But uh, there's probably only space to be super good at a few things. I think most people feel that they can't express, can't create without a license, a channel, a publicist. A degree, like there are things that, that you would need in order to be creative. Here's the, here and here's the thing about the about this podcast situation. I've never done it before, and uh, I'd never written a book before either. Just by chance, I ordered your book and started reading it last week, and finished it two days ago. So, like, super worked out, and I felt so seen by your book because there was that great chapter about creative visualization. And I had never heard that phrase, but I said, yeah, that's what I've been doing my entire life. Um, I have this vision, not, not cosmic, not spiritual, but just this idea where it says, oh, this quite clearly should happen or needs to happen, or I would like for this to happen for myself. And then putting the pieces together along the way, it doesn't seem like a question. It just seems like I'm going through the steps to actualize the thing that I know is going to happen. And then uh, maybe a chapter or two later, you said something like, that's not creative visualization. That's just ambition. And I said, oh, yeah, that, that is ambition. <laughs> <laughs> or that's ego or something where you think, yeah. well, if I, if I want this to happen, it's, it's going to happen. It's just a, a matter of how and when and, and what steps do I need to do to get there. I've had things that seem quite clear where I say, well, oh, I obviously should make a piece with Chris Salise, my, my great friend is a beatboxer and a bunch of tap dancers. But what exactly does that piece look like and who's producing it and where is it happening and how long is it happening? That's the kind of, that's, that's the work. The thing that has never been a question for me is that it's going to happen. I've been thinking a lot about people who talk about being an artist or being artistic or being creative as this sort of pie in the sky dreaming where you, you daydream and anything can happen. It does feel like dreaming, but then it feels like strategizing. And I feel, I feel like an architect where architects have this dream of a house. Frank Lloyd Wright had the waterfall house. And yes, he has this wild, crazy dream, but he also has physics and, and geometry and math and the budget of the, of, you know, whoever's commissioning the project in mind. And so when I get to be creative, there are already a lot of things that I've considered that are parameters, but I find those parameters creatively helpful as opposed to hurtful. I think some people think, oh, you know, I, I have this idea, but I only have a year. Um, or, they, or they dream up this wild idea and then they learn they only have $10,000 and they only have two weeks to do it. Um, but I'm always sort of thinking creatively with parameters in mind. The thing I've gotten better at is just kind of understanding parameters and judging appropriately. But I guess my ambition is moving towards places where I get to move more of the parameters. I also really felt connected to something you mentioned in your book where you said that you consider yourself a part-time artist because I also feel like a part-time artist, meaning that I have days where I feel super creative and, I, and I'm just in the zone working on a particular project or a particular idea and I'm just working it out, working it out. And then the next day, I'm just cooking food and doing yoga and, and talking to my mom on the phone. When you're a kid, you're not thinking about it's the end of the month, the rent is due. Oh crap, I haven't called my friends recently. I probably should check in on them. As a, as a young person, other than homework and puberty and, and a social life, um, those are the things that occupied my brain as like a 12 year old. Um, it was just tap dance. And now it's tap dance and it's Lindy Hop and it's piano and it's the company that I run. I wrote songs easier before I was deemed a professional. 
you know, like when I was waiting tables, it was always something that we were doing. You know, like you say, you went back and you're like, well, back then I could do all I really had was puberty and school. And well, that's that's all day, you know, like 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 almost all of our lives, even if you're a professional, is going to be taken up being a person, you know, and I, I guess that a little bit of the myth around being a, a creator is like, I might go back to Beethoven and just kind of imagine that aside from re- being really bummed about his health and his hearing, that I don't imagine him doing his laundry. In fact, there's some evidence he may not have had to do that sort of thing in that era. You think of the artist as being someone who doesn't have all those things to switch back and forth to. I mean, I spent most of my adult life in buses, planes, cars, meet and greets, press. Maybe a rehearsal would be the closest thing I could get to creative for almost my whole day. And then you end up on stage, but you're repeating what you've done many times before. And I guess my my point is, is that there's no need to think that because someone does something with their the rest of their day that they can't take an hour after work and be a part-time artist because who the hell is not a part-time artist there's this weird idea that we're supposed to be artists 24 hours a day and in that case yes i'm an imposter but i'm not an imposter for the 20 minutes that i might be creative today i know some professional dancers who are terrified to boogie in a social setting um and then i know some people who are not professional dancers who are incredible movers. And it's sort of, they, they love moving and they're fearless. They get out on the dance floor and, and they don't care at all. And it's sort of what you were saying about maybe it's gotten tougher to, to write songs once you were a professional or, or to be an artist once you were a professional. Some of my favorite dancers or some of the most uh, confident dancers I know are not people who have jobs as dancers. And some of the most insecure dancers I know are people who are professional dancers. Sometimes it's much easier to be creative when you don't care about something. And sometimes it's impossible to be creative if you don't care about something. Um, I think I think really all scenarios are valid. Yeah, we're all part-time artists. Even though I am a full-time artist, I am a part-time artist in that I probably spend more time emailing in a year than I do choreographing in the same way that you probably spend more time traveling than you do performing. You're a professional traveler. Just for this moment, I'm a professional broadcaster who, uh, if I never write another song or do anything uh, 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 again, um, the, existentially, I'm I'm a, I'm a podcaster. I mean, I've got the fucking mic and everything. Like, look at this. Like, that's that's how I define myself. When someone asks me, you know. Um, is it lyrics or music first? If you're setting parameters and you're setting limitations and you're sort of setting a goal, the only thing that, that, that we haven't really thought about is what are you saying? There's this myth, I feel, they woke up in the middle of the night and they had to express this very specific thing. When you creatively visualize that you're going to be on a stage, your homies are going to be dancing, your friend's going to be beatboxing, there's going to be X number of people there, the budget's going to be this much, it'll play for three weekends in a row. At what point does it occur to you might want to have something to say? <laughs> I think that that action is the longest part, and that is the most difficult part. Good ideas find their, find their pot that they should live in. They're like nice flowers. But I picked the flowers like over two years in the back of my mind. I thought about it in the back of my mind, maybe every day for a little bit, not consciously, just I would be thinking about it as as one of those things I'd like to do. But once I've decided that an idea is worth doing, then I spend that year basically convincing myself that it's still a good idea. And maybe you do this, where you maybe audition it for yourself. You start writing, saying, I'm going to make a piece that involves this. Or, or you start writing a little bit and you say, actually, it, the the idea doesn't have legs that travel that far. Maybe this is a good 20 second song, but it's not a good five minute song. And then I maybe start auditioning it a little bit to other people. I would, I remember mentioning to my dancers, oh, I'm at this beatboxer, I really think we should work with them. And then I showed a video and someone said, wow, that sounds dope. And then I said, yeah, doesn't that sound dope? And then I, I got positive reinforcement, yes. <laughs> social feedback. Yeah. I started hanging out with Chris Morn and, uh, and we got to do this cool thing at the Kennedy Center with you. And that was actually the first time that Chris and I had properly performed together. And that was completely improvised. And after improvising with Chris for 30 minutes, I said, I said, oh, once we start writing stuff, it's going to be cake because we just, we just 
did 30 minutes and it was so fun and so easy and so interesting. And we didn't even write it. Hi, Ben. My name is Ashley. Yeah. Um, do you believe everything happens for a reason or do you just think the whole universe is chaos? Thanks. <laughs> wow. When you have something that feels like an epiphany, doesn't it always just open more questions, which means that your epiphany is now sort of old news because you have to now figure out the new stuff. I think that's where that sits. And I remember when I was a kid and I was sitting on, on the floor of a garage and I was playing with what I was given uh, at that moment, which was uh, thankfully it wasn't a computer or an iPad or something. It was a stick and uh, and a bucket with some water and stuff in it. So I was swirling the water around and I was watching all the particles kind of just a whole storm of circular particles going around I'm like, you know, two or three years old, I think based on where we lived and all these were just flowing around. I remember thinking, man, okay, this is utter chaos, but it's going in a circle. And each time it comes around, it seems to be making a pattern but it seems to also be complete chaos. I can't figure this out. But I do know that at some point it's all going to come to rest. So does that mean that all of this stuff was intended to go to that space and that's the order? Or is it there because I made it go there? Or am I myself some little particle swirling around the universe with someone else in the stick? And I think that's as close as I ever got to it. When it comes to music, I do think that it's it's almost necessary to embrace a certain amount of chaos because you're working your way through a creative question that you don't have the answer to. And I think a problem with the way people look at creativity is they believe that we have a master plan. I look back in time and think about, I don't know, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, Ravel, Prokofiev, all this stuff that I listen to and can't believe these people came up with this stuff. And it seems like they had a plan. It seems like there was fate. But it started from chaos and it entered the chaos and it embraced the chaos. And at the end of the day, there is a certain amount of that chaos that seems to have been harnessed. Yet when you finish it, the best pieces of music open up another question, just like your question. The question within the question within the question. Good to talk to you, Ashley. Thank you. Thanks for making me think about that. It's weird to be put on the spot where you're like, secret of the universe. Where do babies come from? Go. All right. Ashley, I hope to see you out there sometime. Thank you very much. And I, I want to keep in mind fragile, creative people who do other things and haven't had the audacity uh, that we've had to go out and and uh, and and fail at it some. I mean, you have like numbers of years, you know, like eight years. I want to be doing this. When you go back, where where does where does this start? The 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 ambition, the seed. Well, I started tap dancing at ten, so I actually do remember taking my first steps in that. So I remember the the before time where I just used to dance on my bed and I used to drum on the little partition in the back of the car, and then I remember sort of having both experience formalized by, by education. It was just about what kept my interest long enough. I was like a kid who was interested in a lot of things. Talk about fragile. I was the most fragile little kid. I was like, a, my mom refers to me as a collapsible cup of a child where like I'd sit at the dinner table, like just, just, you know, you know how, you know how like small skinny kids are. And now you're an athlete, which is awesome. I guess so. I yeah, I think you are. Yeah. It was quite clear that I was interested in a lot of things and I could get interested in a lot of things. And then after a certain time, my interest would wane. And tap dance and dance specifically was the first time that my interest did not wane. And I think part of that is because I found something that really made sense for me. It activated the parts of my brain that really associate with rhythm and it, it was embodied. It also was social. I, my drum lessons were, were pretty, uh, or one on one with my friend's mom. And I and I played in a little Sum 41 cover band in elementary school. That's right. And <laughs> um, 
drumming was a pretty a pretty individual task and suddenly I was in a group of people and I kind of got introduced to the wider world of young people who were good at tap dance and I liked the whole scene and it had just become my background activity it became the thing I thought about and it was the it was also the first place where I started to express myself creatively but the thing that I was really committed to the thing that occupied my brain was tap dance um, or, or rhythmic rhythmic concepts um, in the way that you probably you can close your eyes and envision a keyboard I could hear things and envision things and it was just it was a constant background activity in school in conversation I could always be running some sort of idea in my head in the background was the immediate ambition just to be able to do it or did you kind of have like I I'll admit when I was making up songs in my head when I was eight, nine years old, I heard applause when they were over. <laughs> and I didn't do it in front of people yet, but I really saw it being a, 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 a finished thing. It was an activity that I could be fully immersed in without pressuring myself to be immersed in it. It was sort of obsessive. Um, it was, but, but not because I wanted to be obsessive, just because that's how my brain took to it. Like, uh, like people who have obsessions with chocolate or something, you, you can't, you could always eat more. I really like tap dance uh, as a sort of metaphorical, philosophical device because essentially tap dance is as expressive as you, the tap dancer, think it is and that you can convince people it is. Like piano is a limited instrument compared to an orchestra, but you can convince people that the piano is all you could ever need. But I've seen people really stretch the boundaries with so few palettes, right? So few colors or, or what have you. Tap dance from a, a tonal standpoint is an incredibly limited instrument. And tap dance from a physical standpoint is also a relatively limited genre compared to what ballet dancers do. They can do all this r ridiculous athletic stuff and they lift their leg and they turn around and, and tap dancers don't do any of that. And yet, hypothetically, I should be able to, to hold attention as a solo improvisational maybe or a choreographed or a group tap dancer than uh, an instrument that has 88 keys or a dancer that can do athletic feats that are quite obviously exciting. Well, I think what you're talking about is essentially one, being a true believer and secondly, is, is casting a spell. I'd look at your limitations and think tap, 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 couple spins, one dude, Jesus, where are we going with this? Like, how can you, how can you get where you get? I'm someone who, who leaves movies all the time and I, I like won't, won't go to pee or anything when I'm watching you. I'm, I'm there for the whole thing, but there's not that much to work with. A uh, piano is a lot more to work with, but of course what you said was it's not an orchestra and creating uh, the spell that it is an orchestra is partially uh, my believing it. But the other is a, a great deal of um, dynamic constraint. If I'm going to make the piano seem like it's loud, well, it, I know that it's not. We know that it's not. I can never go to 10. I have to make people feel like I've gone to 10 when I'm at 7. You know, And then if I do to go to 10, suddenly it's like it's 11 or 12 or something, and you get to step out. But I always had to play on stages at festivals as a solo pianist after playing like after heavy metal band or something, I was always put in that position. So the thing to do is to insist for me to insist the dynamics to actually tell people that the constraints are way more than they actually are. You know, and I've noticed before, like, especially when you, when you improv, you often start really small, which gives you a place to go. Do you feel like the, the videos do it justice or do you feel like you had to be there? Honestly, I am sometimes a little ashamed of my, my presence on the internet because I've done so much in person and I am kind of desperate ever, for everyone to come see a show. Obviously, now is not the time, but I feel like so many people have decided that they they like what I do from seeing a 60 second video. And I always think, oh, I'm, I'm really bad at being on tape. You really got to come see a show and be in the room and hear what it sounds like in the room. I rely on that feedback. I rely on that presence. Uh, I rely on it for myself and I rely on it because I think that the work I make is meant to be seen in a live capacity, which is why I haven't released a ton of 
videos of full concerts that my company has done or anything. Uh, that's maybe like a goal for the next 20 years or something to feel more comfortable with video work. Every time I see a video of myself, I think, oh, it's not really what it is. If I make a recording um, and put it out to the world, I think there is an expectation. Everyone knows there are thousands of plugins to make it perfect. There, every, your average person knows what auto tune is. Everyone knows what reverb is. And so there's an expectation of perfection to where at a certain point music has gotten to where it's just basically an idea. You want to have a perfect wrapped, just sterile version of your idea. With, there's nothing in your world like that. You literally leave it on the stage. You, you said something like that in your book too. None of us get the experience of experiencing us as an outsider and and our voices sound like a particular way when they resonate in our heads and they sound completely different on on tape but everyone responds to you in a, a particular way um i i think uh i think that's in terms of the things i'm not doing right or the things that make us all human is i have i have uh insecurity i don't like watching myself on video i mean a lot of people who are uh, uh, you know, scared of, of uh, writer's block or they're afraid of failure. I assume you don't consider every one of your projects a great success. No, um, that would be great. You've compiled albums by playing songs for years and then deciding they should live somewhere. I have that same experience in that I make a piece and then I show it to someone and then it gets more work based on the first five, 10 performances that we, we do of it. Um, so I don't, I don't have to be the, the sole judge of whether something's a success. And honestly, if I were, then I wouldn't have much of an audience. It, it, it requires other people to decide what is a success and what isn't a success. And to me, it's in terms of success, it's not about, it's not really about what I think of it. Um, that, that is kind of separate from what people general people think of it. For me, a success is a is is that I explored it, that I did it. And the only time where I feel like something wasn't a success is when I I shied away from doing what I I meant to do. Or I I I fell through on, on what I what I meant to do. Um, in terms of like pur purpose, purpose to execution. I have to kind of create a delusional situation for myself where no, I'm being asked to do this. I'm going to have to finish that this song. Everyone's expecting me to finish the song and there's a, a budget and a deadline. And I guess I'm going to have to, yeah, you know, God wants me to finish this song. I mean, I just, I go, I have to do that so that I'll do the next one. And, and that keeps me from worrying about whether the last one was a failure. Fear of failure, one, it's natural. People are going to fear it. But you can't get anywhere unless you fail. It's really kinder on everyone else. I love footage of Muhammad Ali walking through, whether it's his hometown or a village in Africa or New York City, people would follow him, signing things for me. It's like, don't forget to floss. And, and just, he, he never made them feel like they were idiots for following him. I feel like you're, you, you do have a kindness as a performer that is makes it it's neutral it makes it feel okay there are only kind of a couple of performers i can think of who have that quality failure is part of the recipe it has to it must happen so people have to make that first step finish a thing fail get it behind them set up a new circumstance or they'll never create anything way back when we recorded our episode with caleb teicher i forgot to ask them for the new week's resolution. You know, the exercise, creative exercise that we do once a week. I have a text here now. Caleb writes, my assignment for the week, listen to one recording, any song, anything with your eyes closed. Don't cook. Don't answer a text. Don't drink water, nothing. Just you and the recording and your total attention. I think that's a great exercise. Let's make that a daily thing. Um, only takes three to five minutes, form a meditation, creative, and it locks you in on, uh, on one task at a time. I dig it. That's Caleb Teicher's New Week's Resolution. My, my most frequent dance partner is a guy named Nathan View, 
and I he's kind of he's kind of like a guru to me of of jazz dance. Um, he's he's my dance partner, but I also look up to him a lot. And when we first started working together, and we would we did a 20, 25 minute swing dance duet to Ella Fitzgerald recordings. We would take solos in it, like minute long solos. And I remember asking Nathan, Nathan, what do you think about when you improvise? And he really didn't answer me for a long time, which is sort of his style. But then he ended up saying something like, I think I'm just kind of hoping to do one good thing. Because if I do one good thing, then people will remember the entire solo as a good thing. And for the most part, they won't really remember if anything didn't go well. And I, and I often think about that, how mediocre I can be sometimes and how great that is and how mediocre we all can be sometimes. I would like to think I'm always excellent, but sometimes I'm, I'm just not. I think Jerome Robbins is a phenomenal choreographer, was a phenomenal choreographer. And I saw a piece of his as part of a, a, a works in process series at the Guggenheim. Um, it was a piece that isn't usually seen of his. And I watched it and just thought, gosh, that was awful. <laughs> that was really bad. Yeah. <laughs> but that, <laughs> that doesn't change the fact that I think West Side Story is brilliant. And you know, it's amazing. That's probably the only time I'll ever see that piece. And no one says, wow, Drum Robbins, a genius, West Side Story. But have you seen that piece he made in the 80s? What garbage, right? No one cares. People are inclined to remember the best thing you did or the thing that they liked the most. And if they're inclined to think about the things that you did that were so bad, then that's, that's not really up to you. That's, that's, that's between them and themselves. It's like the poor Beatles. Like they moved on from the Beatles and even prior to the Beatles. And everything that they were doing at that moment was the most important artistic thing that, that they were doing. Hundreds of shitty songs. No one knows what they are. And then stuff like people like to make fun of Paul McCartney and Wings at some point. But I, I, I think now many are seeing that it's actually brilliant stuff. But at the same time, it's like it's it's brilliant because it's it's free and dynamic. Part of dynamics is not just simply loud and soft. It's it's engaging and not engaging. The reason that people love to see an improv is because well, we don't know where it's going. We're not sure. And if one good thing happens, it wasn't about the one good thing that happened. It was about the trip that you all took, the discovery that you all made together. And then Eureka, yes, we're there. And 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 that. You know, when you create a piece of any kind, I think part of the uh, of the art of it is being allowing yourself to fail, and that a song is not brilliant line, brilliant line, brilliant line, brilliant line, rhyme, rhyme, not rhyme, rhyme, rhyme. It's not like that. It's like being in the middle of the song and suddenly feeling choked up, and you don't know why. You look back at the lyrics, and it's like, well, the first six lines don't, and that's not that. Oh, and then it hits you. But if you just read that line out of nowhere or you heard that, it wouldn't mean anything. And I think such is the life of an artist in general. Uh, I don't consider myself a perfectionist at all. And I know that's a thing that artists like to say about themselves, but it ha I've never connected to it. Listen, you anyone could write the, the, the next part of our dialogue, which basically is that I think that you're a perfectionist and you don't think so. And you think I'm a perfectionist, and I don't think so. I mean, you may not believe that, that I'm a perfectionist or that I think that, but, but that would be normal. Like the normal thing really is for someone to feel or to say, I'm not a perfectionist. But when you look at how hard they work, I think perfectionism is a little misunderstood because uh, you're going to get into technique. I can tell that already by your piano playing. Like- you're into technique. You feel yourself as a perfectionist or that you're beating yourself up because there are no imperf imperfect moments. It just means that whatever you do, you strive to do it as well as you can. I think I probably am a perfectionist, to be honest. I'm obsessive, but I'm not a perfectionist. I'm meaning yeah. that once I start thinking you don't regret. about something, once I, yeah, once I start thinking about something, I can think about it over and over again. I'll not, I'll not spend extra time on things. I, I frequently will look at a a picture or a, a video of something and say, yeah, that's fine. Um, and I, and I actually have to bring in someone who dances for me. Her name is Macy Sullivan and she is my dance editor. I, once I write it, the idea is out there and I, I can't say whether or not there are sloppy sections or things that are missing. I rely on Macy to go, Hey, there are three people in the back and two of them are doing this. And one person is doing this. 
And I said, oh, yeah, that's what I told them to do. And she said, okay, that they should all be doing the same thing. And I said, oh, oh, okay, cool. But I don't have that kind of vision. And I think some people can get really uh, perfectionist-y or obsessive about, about their own work. But for me, once I've made it, and if, it, if the general idea is working, then it's great. If we're all on the same page as to what we mean to do, then I don't need to sit over someone or even myself and say, but you didn't do exactly that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not for splitting hairs. A lot of my, my hubris or my, or the ego that I have is self-motivated. And a lot of it is supported by social conditioning, not by Instagram or by applause necessarily, but by people who continue to say that what I'm doing is worth doing. I think some people no matter how many people like their stuff, never get enough validation. And I think one of the things that maybe has worked out for me is that I maybe need, I need like two people to like it. And then I can go back to, I can go back to concentrating on the thing. So that would be your advice to, uh, to people who are having uh, problems with uh, fears of completion and, and, uh, and, and, and sharing their, their art at all is to, is to basically go shoot fish in a barrel, like find a couple of people who really just love you no matter what you do, play it, show it, perform it for them, get a little bit of medicine from that, take a deep breath and then jump back in. Oh yeah, get the dopamine rush of someone saying, ah, oh, that's great, I dig that. Doesn't even care, doesn't even care if they're a music critic or, or a qualified professional. They just need to be someone to say, you're doing okay. Because I think for the most part, that's what most humans are looking for. That kind of mythical version of the artist that we brought up a couple of times is not supposed to care what anyone thinks. And they just make stuff just for them. And while I understand why that's a good cue, like it's a good cue for creating something that is not watered down before it gets out there. You know, it's like, I made this for me and I don't care what other people think. At some point, you probably do need to be in such a zone that you don't care because you don't need a committee writing in your head all the time. But at the same time, I still haven't met anybody as many brilliant geniuses as I've been you know, lucky enough to meet who, after spending time with them, I would not believe them if they said they don't care what anyone thinks. I did a, a Chinese archaeologist for two years, and she talked about how difficult it must be to require so many people to dig what you're doing for your work to be perpetuated. Whereas for her, if like the people who who run the institutions and run the the higher education systems and are like the greatest sinologists uh, and archaeologists in the world appreciate what she's doing, then she's got a job for the rest of her life. And that's like 10 people. Like if 10 people are her audience and she satisfies those 10 people, then she's set. If I only have 10 people that like what I'm doing, then I get to play one show a year for 10 people who live in my neighborhood. Maybe. Um, and I, I think that is, I think that's tough uh, because we often talk about the abstract, what do the people want <laughs> out of, out of what we're doing or something like that. But I, I've actually had a lot of conversations with a, a, a collaborator of mine recently who, who I think has struggled more in recent years than I have with, with wanting everyone to like what she's doing. And I mm -hmm. said, well, let's make, a, let's make a short list. Who are the people who you really hope will like your work? And we sat down and kind of made a list of, you know, people in the abstract. I would really love if Nicki Minaj loved my work. Um, and I also would really love if my husband liked my work. Um, and then once... She could check off that the work she was doing could satisfy that target audience. Then she didn't have to worry about the two people on the internet who didn't like her video. You look at a YouTube video and it has like whatever, 600 likes. And then there are two people that didn't like it. And you think, who are those people? <laughs> Well, and then, and God help you, if you bother to scroll down to the comment section, you'll find out who they were. <laughs> I was interested to find that Stephen King doesn't know how his book's going to end, but he knows authors who know how they're going to end first. He just takes characters, puts them in an impossible situation and discovers how they get out. So everyone's got, you know, I think you're very closely, everything that you're saying is fairly 
I I get it. You know, one of my favorite shows I I saw collaborations of yours was you and Nick because it brought in storytelling and I found that to be really and singing too and some almost performance art where there was eating sandwiches and hanging out and 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 and, and also that there were some a couple of real Fruit Loops, well-meaning, kind Fruit Loops in the audience who were really loud. They were like talking to you, like you're performing like right next to them. And so there's no, the whole thing to me was bizarre because it's formal, but it's not formal and you're there, but you're not there and you're singing and you're telling stories. Two dancers, half of it improv, some storytelling, some, is there a fifth wall? Is there not a fifth wall? All that stuff. And you pulled it off, and it, and and it was awesome. That show too only got crazier. That's that's the closest I've ever gotten to like rock and roll. Just like Nick and I did a tour of Ireland and Scotland last year, maybe the year before, and we like we performed at a bar. We performed that piece at a bar in in Lep, Ireland, like rural or like in in the in the pub in town, the only pub in town. And then we performed it at an art gallery the next day with like you know light bulb bullshit um and uh and then we performed it at a church the next day and and as you can imagine a piece like that that is improvised and then has so much storytelling and so much kind of feedback just vacillated from one day to the next one night we have like people just drunkenly going yep whoop, you know whatever and uh people just talking at us during the show and then the next night we're in a church one of the things that i create a visualized for my next album should that ever happen was being in the same room with you and Nick, some beatboxing, upright piano, and mic everything exactly in perspective of what it would be, meaning that you're on my right, Nick is on my left, and maybe beatboxer's Chris, right? Is in the middle. And that's the way it's recorded, like so that you hear you guys are the drums, the background vocals, the orchestra the story, everything just on a recording. I would like to accomplish that at some point. My, my favorite thing about art is it says, you thought the world was this, and then we reveal a whole nother layer of, of, the, of the thing. And, and suddenly you walk away saying, I didn't even know that was, that was a thing you could do, and now I do. All right, man, well, take care of yourself. And it's really good, really good to see you. So I asked Caleb to send me uh, a video. Uh, or a voice note of some kind of musical idea that we could make something out of. Uh, Caleb is one of the best drummers I know. And uh, they gave me a rhythm, which we call a hemiola. And that's three against two. So they're doing three with their feet and two with the hands. And uh, it went like this. That's it. So what to make out of that? Well, I just took that and built on it with a variety of instruments. And as they say in Australia, Bob's your uncle. If you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot.